Welcome to Sartor TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton. Today I'm talking with Kabir Segel, the author of Coined. Kabir, thanks so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Let's start by having you tell us just a little bit about your career background and journey. Yeah, I began my career um, on Wall Street at J.P. Morgan, and I started maybe a few months before the credit crisis began, and the world was falling apart. Markets were tanking, people were losing their jobs, and I was like, man, what is going on in the marketplace? What's going on in America? Whatever happens in America really affects the world. So I took a job at J.P. Morgan, and I was always curious about what was happening in the markets, and that's what eventually led me to pursue one career in investment banking and pursue another career of writing a book that explains my career <laughs> in investment banking. What do you think has made you so successful in your career? I think for me it's understanding that one job does not give 100% satisfaction. Mm. You know, we talk about in the investment community you should have a well-balanced portfolio. Diversify between your stocks, your bonds, your cash. Um, I think you should do that with your life. Mm. And not just with your life, you do that with your job. And so while I was working at, at J.P. Morgan, something deep within me really asked the question, what am I doing to help other people? What am I doing to help those who are less uh, fortunate than me? So I began a charity in New Orleans to help musicians come back to New Orleans after Katrina. And so the advice in, in, that I've always followed is, you know, find the good things in your job. Maybe you like it 75% and then, you know, make something else 25%. So diversify in your life because not, not just one thing gives you 100% satisfaction. What about mentors? What role have mentors played in your life? Who have been a couple of your mentors? Yeah, my mentor is a man named Andrew Young. Mm -hmm. Andrew Young was a reverend. He was an aide to Dr. Martin Luther King. Wow. He was the mayor of Atlanta, congressman, um, and uh, ambassador to the United Nations under Jimmy Carter. Uh, my, my parents, my dad ended up working with him. And when I was in second grade, I, he was the, then the mayor. And I asked Mayor Young, I said, I'd like to interview you for my school newspaper. And he said yes, and we started a correspondence, 20 years of correspondence, of him mentoring me and telling me very contrarian advice. Hmm. And something like, Kabir, you want to go help people go work in an investment bank. Learn how to make money before you give it away. He says, you know, don't do charity. You know, help people help themselves. Hmm. And so I've always been able to talk with Uncle Andy, um, to debate him. We have 50 years between us. Wow. He's you know, 50 years yeah. older than me. We ended up writing a book together. It's my last book called Walk in My Shoes. And so he's always been a sounding board for me to see what I should be doing in my life and what are the questions I should be asking. I believe I saw him interviewed a lot um, after the Charleston shooting. Um, what is it like to have a mentor who's so, such a well-known thought leader? He's great because, again, he's so provocative mm. in his thought process. Mm. Um, you know, he tells a story about, uh, he calls him Martin, Dr. King. He said, when I was a Martin, when I was with Dr. King, Dr. King would always get angry at Andy when Andy didn't give a controversial opinion. He says, I want you to give a controversial opinion, the most conservative opinion possible, because that way I can come down in the center. <laughs> You'd be on the right, everyone else be on the left. And so Uncle Andy's always playing devil's advocate with me. And so wow. you even see in the Charleston situation, he always comes back to the source of the problem, which is uh, jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of unemployment there. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when a kid feels disenfranchised, look, it's a hateful act. But do you hate the person or you hate the deed? Mm -hmm. Right? And, and racism is a disease. Mm -hmm. It's a disease of, of lack of education. Yeah. So it's really great to talk with him and to see the world through his eyes as much as I can. Why did you want to become an officer in the U.S. Naval Reserve? Yeah, I was in uh, university in New Hampshire, and New Hampshire is one of the first presidential primary states. I volunteered on John Kerry's presidential campaign, oh, okay. um, not, not really knowing any better. I just wanted to get involved in the political yeah. process. He ended up winning, and his campaign, if you recall, was a lot about Vietnam veterans, and uh, I was staffed with Matt Cleland. He was a triple amputee senator from um, Georgia, where I'm from, and I pushed his wheelchair, and I accompanied him all over America. Wow. And so we went to many um, American Legion and VFW halls. And so it always struck in me a chord of a band of brothers doing something bigger than yourselves. 
And so when the opportunity came up to receive a commission or to apply to receive a commission from the U.S. Navy, um, it was a lot of soul searching. My parents were all against it. My family was yeah. all against it. They, nev they never served in the military. And um, it's really an honor to wear the uniform and to serve even in uh, the limited capacity that I am. Uh, and that's why I wanted to do something which I learned on the Kerry campaign and it was really about serving my country. So you are also a jazz bassist right. and a Grammy winning producer. Right. How does music play a role in your career? What's, what's the role of music <laughs> in your life? Music is, is everything to me. Um, there's a great saying that you can leave the music but it never leaves you, right? And for me, jazz music, man, I can still remember the, the first time my sister brought home a jazz recording. I couldn't believe that they were actually like making up the music, improvising, and, and it sounded so good, right? Yeah. And you go to any jazz recording, any jazz performance, it'll always be different because it's always improvised. And so for me, as I left um, the jazz world, I, was, I studied music and I toured professionally. Um, I said, what can I do to be affiliated with the music? And that's why I began my charity, uh -huh. Helping Musicians yeah. uh, in New Orleans. It was basically a stock brokerage for musicians. Which, so the music also has been a great way to connect with folks. Yeah. So for example, last December, I brought 57 people with me to Cuba um, to make a new album called Cuba, The Conversation Continues. Cuban and American musicians coming together and playing. We were there when Obama made his announcement <laughs> that we're normalizing relations, <gasps> making an album called Cuba, The Conversation Continues. So wow. it was an incredible time to be there. Um, and who did we bring? We brought, I brought fund managers and lawyers and teachers, a bunch of musicians. And Arturo O'Farrell, the musician I work with, he and I are putting this album out together in a few weeks. And it's really a piece of cultural diplomacy. Mm. How musicians can say things that politicians can. You know, musicians have been collaborating for the last 50 years. Now the politicians are finally catching up with us. So music has given me an art form to speak my mind and have an impact. And so that's why music has been a guiding force for me. It always has been and always will be. What advice do you give to young people coming behind you who want to rise to the top today? Two things. I say you're a leaf in a divine wind, which is wherever you are, the time is where you need to be. There's a reason you are where you are, right? And it's your responsibility to learn as much as you can from that situation and move from it if you want. But I was working in a bank. I didn't love working in a bank all the time, <laughs> but I made it my platform. I was able to write a lot. I was able to serve. I was able to travel the world. And so it's important to see your situation in life and learn as much as you can from it because that will prepare you for the next chapter in life. Mm -hmm. And so don't try to rush to the next thing. The opportunities will come. And so. I say again, I'm a leaf in a divine wind that, look, it, wherever I'm meant to be is where I'm going to be. There's advice which is go out and follow your dreams. Look, I'm not sure if that's following your passion is the, most be is the best advice. Steve Jobs did not follow his passion, right? Remember this? When Steve Jobs was a young man. He did some drugs, traveled around the world. He wasn't that interested in technology. Huh. He was just really curious. Yeah. He was very intense. And mm -hmm. so when he stumbled onto technology, then went with it. If he was really interested in technology, he would have become an intern at Hewitt Packard, <laughs> right. right? And worked his way up. Yeah. So be curious about the world, and like, opportunities will come your way if you're if you're seeking. You mm. have to be a seeker. What has been the biggest challenge that you've faced in your career so far, and how have you overcome that? I think probably early in my career, I started a company which was probably ill-advised. Right after university, uh, graduate school, I moved to. Um, India to start a company with my friend and we failed abysmally. We lost some money and uh, we put a lot of hard work and sweat in there. But it was probably in retrospect, we didn't do the market analysis. We didn't even know if the, a product like this, there was any demand for our product. So it was kind of a foolish undertaking, but it was, it was a necessary one because now when I take on a business undertaking, I think back, maybe I should do more due diligence before I just jump in. Mm. So that was probably the beginning of my career. It was good to make the mistakes earlier in my career than, than later. Can learn a lot from failure, right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. What do you think makes a really great leader? Conviction and having a view of the long game. Uh, you can pick so many leaders um, and they keep focused on the long-term 
game plan. Mm. Uh, it's tough when you see the news every day and you see your name in the news or the or it's a 24 hour news cycle. Mm -hmm. Like how do you remain, keep perspective? Um, yeah. You know, David Rubenstein, the great uh, billionaire investor in 2008, you know, he's a private equity investor. He has a six year investment horizon. During the 2008 crisis, people were saying you should shorten that down to one year. And he resisted that. And now his returns are bigger than almost anyone hmm. if you in the long run. It's so hard to do, especially yeah. in, a, I mean, can you imagine Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence today, sitting down uninterrupted for hours at a time writing, <laughs> like without, a, without Google alerts, without like your Facebook going off or your um, Twitter account? Like, it's, it's keeping focus on the long run. Mm. That's what's so matter. That's what's so important for great leaders. Let's talk about Coined, great. which is a fascinating book. Thank you. Why did you write Coined? Why right now? Look, in America, we have a uh, a problem with our financial literacy. I mm -hmm. think so many people, so many Americans spend more than they make. Yeah. They're over, uh, they're indebted. They have uh, way too much money on their student loans oftentimes. And I thought working on Wall Street, I wanted to know what was happening in your mind. What was happening in your brain when you, sit, when you think of money, when you, when you deal with money? Hmm. Does money have a biological effect on us? So I wrote this book, Coined. I went to f 25 countries. My job took me around the world, from Mongolia to Sri Lanka to Vietnam to Ecuador. And I researched the topic for over four years. And I was really, it was a personal journey of mine, but I was hoping my personal journey could help share with more Americans about what money is and why it has such a profound impact on our lives. What is the big idea? There's so many ideas in this book, but what's the one sort of overarching big idea you want people to take away <laughs> from Coin? I wish there was one. It would make it easier <laughs> for me. Um, that we define money, hmm. um, but at the same time, it, it shapes us, right? It's a living, organic thing that is constant. Is, is we invent new forms of money, inevitably we're going to shape and reshape how humans interact with each other, right? I mean, I opened my book on the streets of Jakarta. Yeah, it's such a cool story. Yeah, and, and um, there's a lady who gets in who's holding a baby into my taxi. And I'm like, what is she doing here? And I realized she's just trying to make a little, little bit of money to allow us to take the HOV, the, the passenger, the, the carpool lane. Yeah. And without money, I would have never met her. So money really sort of guides our behavior. It, I mean, so many people we know are because of money. The people mm -hmm. you deal with, people you work with, it's because of money. You have a common interest. Yeah. And so the, the more we change money in the future, the more we'll change our interactions. Can you imagine a situation where um, I, I don't meet her because there's a new technology where I can just add a, a dollar and pay an extra fare. Maybe I would have never met her. Yeah. So I want people to know that uh, this is not a how-to book. This book is a book that says why. Why do we use money in the first place and how should we use it in the future? You break the exploration of money into mind, body, and soul, which I thought was really, really interesting. Why did you do it this way? Yeah, in, in my book, it is that mind, body, and soul because it affects all parts of our lives. Like in our mind, when I say the word money, it uh, elicits a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, the reward center of the brain. They've taken brain scans of people who are high on cocaine and compare them to people who are on money, who look at money. They find that they're the same. They take um, men, and show them pictures of dead bodies, naked women, and money. And what gets the most excitement? It's money. <laughs> so there's actually a biological in our, in our minds, how we conceive of money, is super stimulating, right? That's that, you know, and then in terms of body, it, if I tell you, you know, for $20,000, I want you to come uh, to the park with me, you'll move your body. <laughs> you, <laughs> you will move your body, You yes. will be there, right? <laughs> Even for $200, I'll probably be there. <laughs> and your soul, look, you've studied the scriptures, like 80% of what the, the scriptures, eight of the, I think, 10 um, uh, parables in the book of Matthew are about money or wealth, right? The New Testament, Jesus is always talking about money or what to do with wealth, or his parables are some, somewhat couched in ag agrarian economics. Mm, mm -hmm. So Jesus, the, the, the New Testament, even the Old Testament, is uncomfortable how much they're talking about money. The Quran, 83 verses having to do with money, hmm. right? Um, Hinduism, a lot of teaching about money. So whichever God you subscribe to, they're all talking about what to do or what not to do with money. Why is that? So they're saying one of the uh, measurements of your soul is however you use money can determine the fate of your soul. 
Hmm. Yeah. Right? Because it reveals what your priorities are. So that's why I broke it up into mind, body, and soul. How was money originally invented? Yeah. What was the origination? How did it go down? So there's a theory which um, Adam Smith, even Aristotle, talks about that money begins with bartering, right? And so I wanted something, you wanted something, we did a trade, um, and eventually money replaces barter. So this is actually a myth that anthropologists have discovered. Mm. Anthropologists have gone back and say, well, wait a second. There's actually, bartering is not what you do with someone that you know. Bartering is what you do with someone who you don't know. Like mm. you're never going to see him again. Mm -hmm. And they say, there's one Cambridge anthropologist who writes, there's never been a society in the history of the world that's ever existed, which is a pretty emphatic statement, <laughs> that relies exclusively on money. And so the first currency, and it makes sense, is debt. Right? Mm -hmm. Debt is the first currency. Social debt, the favor bank, doing favors for each other. Right? And this makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Yeah. Like when you're a caveman and you kill a, a goat or something, or a deer, and you bring it back to the feeding station, like you're supposed to share it with your friends, with your tribe, uh -huh. because the day will come when you're hungry and you don't share it, that you will not be invited back. Mm -hmm. So other animals, apes, primates, symbiosis, debt, they're basically doing favorite gifts for each other. Mm -hmm. And so if you look into the, the earliest part of the archaeological register, in, in 4000 BC, there's loan documents. People are loaning out money to each other, silver, wow. barley. It's not until the 7th century BC until coins are invented. So you have 3,000 years of debt, financial loan obligations, before coins, what we think of as money, are wow. invented. So Adam Smith wasn't entirely correct. It's not bartering, which was the first type of money. It's debt. Actually, it's interesting. When you look at debt, the CEO of, J of JP Morgan, where I used to work, Jamie Diamond, he keeps a list in his suit pocket of people who owe him something. Really? Yeah, so this whole idea of debt is universal. We all live by it. Even wow. the most, the biggest corporate titans um, <sighs> keep track of their gift economy. Yeah. You talk about how money is sort of tied to evolution or vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> talk a little bit about this. I went to the Galapagos Islands to study money. Why did I do that? Because that's where Charles Darwin went to be inspired with his theory of evolution by natural selection. So while I was there, I went with some marine biologists and they showed me that all around the different ecosystems from underwater to the apex predators, all organisms trade energy with each other, right? Mm -hmm. When the birds and the bees, they're basically trading energy. They're eating each other. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get the calories we need to survive. Mm -hmm. What is the first type of money? It's meat, salt. When you boil it down, money helps us obtain the calories to survive. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it goes even further than that, that there's a genetic basis for why we use money. So researchers have found that there are genes that we have that help us become more likely to exchange with each other. You know, people who live in isolation, they, um, they've been shown to be not as healthy. Like they, it's, living alone is analogous to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, mm. um, to having higher rates of obesity. Um, and so it's important to engage with each other and be social. It's a survival mechanism for us. And so you look at recent scholarship, genetic studies, they've been able to find that identical twins who have the same genotype, when they separate them, they find that they invest in a similar manner. Really? Yeah, so it shows you that your genes, like in, in one study, I think maybe 20% of your credit score was influenced by your genes. Wow. You, if you, there's one gene that we have, there are two variants of it. If you have one variant of it, you're more likely to be risk averse, to have fewer credit lines, to take fewer, fewer risks. If you have the other variant of it, it's just the opposite. Hmm. So your genes, not the only <laughs> thing, but genes help explain a lot of your financial decision making. So that's what, I mean, Charles Darwin, uh, his theory of evolution made me ask the question, do genes play a role in your financial decision making? I discovered yes, they do. And can you change that? Can you develop that? Yeah, you can. Um, you can definitely change that over time, uh, largely to do with education. Now, mm. In these studies, your mm -hmm. knowledge can triumph over your genetics. Not everyone in these studies acted according to their genes, but um, enough people <laughs> acted in that way so they were able to find that there's, it is a strong indicator. And if you look at the markets, the markets are basically a measure of aggregate human behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So. Just as Wall Street is, is researching, trying to predict stocks in the future, 
who knows, they may be able to look at your genes to predict stock market patterns and predict the market. You talk in the book about the anthropology of debt. What mm -hmm. is that? So while I was traveling around um, the world looking at money, uh, people almost universally see money as a way to measure debts. So just if you think about it as an inch or a kilometer is a measurement of distance, think about money as a measurement for debt, right? And so, for example, I was in Japan and I bought some really delicious fruits for a friend of mine. And he said, Kabira, I cannot accept this from you. And I said, well, why not? He says, well, you're leaving back for New York. I'll never be able to repay this. Huh. And the word arigato in Japanese means it is too difficult, meaning it's too difficult for me to accept this. Sumisayan, another word that means thank you, is, uh, is an ap apologetic saying, I, I really can't accept it. Do not give mm. this to me. In Japan, for example, when you go to a, a wedding and you tie the ribbon on the present, you have to tie it perfectly because if you tie it too loosely, you may imply that the wedding may not last, uh -huh. the marriage may not last. When you go to a department store, right, you have to make sure that, that they're wrapping the present because if you do a poor job, you may imply that um, they're not, that you haven't spent the, the right amount of time uh, packaging the present. Wow. So but why do I, these are all these cultural quirks. Wherever you go in the world, there's all these cultural quirks around how people deal with debt, right? Mm. So that's Japan. It's peculiar to us, right? Um, it's peculiar, in Japan, it's peculiar that we buy chocolates for each other on Valentine's Day mm. for people that we're romantically involved with. 70% of women in, in Japan report buying chocolates to men they feel obligated to who have helped them in their career. Huh. It's called obligation chocolate, chocolate ungiri, right? And so that's peculiar. And I've given the example about Jamie Dimon. He keeps, you know, in America, he keeps a list in his breast pocket of people who owe him something. So we all talk about, you know when you say, oh, I owe you one, mm -hmm. I invested in that friendship, I spent time with him. We're all tracking um, who's, who we're we good with and who's, we're not, we're not good with, right? And so that idea of money is debt is, is so universal to how we live and how we harmonize with people in the world. What is the significance of the artwork or the various images that we see on our money? Some of the artwork on money is incredible. Like one of the things I discovered on U.S. money, so on the U.S. dollar bill, there are all kinds of secret symbols. Right? One of the most secret symbols, I don't think many people know this, is when you look at the back of a dollar bill, there's a, an eagle with a ribbon in its mouth. Right? This is the, yeah. the great seal of America. And in that, on that ribbon it says E Pluribus Unum. Right? Well, if you actually look into where that symbol comes from, it goes back to the third century BC. Hmm. Right? It's an ancient Babylonian legend called the Etana Epic which, not to bore you with this, but there's a, a story where a king is trying to go help his wife reproduce, so he needs to find a special birth plant. And he finds a serpent and an eagle, like on the side of the road, essentially. And the, the eagle has, is basically, he's, he's dying, and um, he's dying because the serpents punished him, because the eagle had eaten the serpent's young. Hmm. So that image of a, of a snake in the beak of an eagle goes back to the third millennium. It shows up all around the world. It shows up on the, um, on the Pope's insignia in the 13th century. Mm -hmm. It shows up in the Hindu river civil civilization in India. It shows up on the uh, Mexican flag. It shows up on the new Mexican flag. It shows up on the dollar bill. So these symbols go back to the beginning of time, beginning of civilization. So that was one symbol I was fascinated to see. It's not just an American symbol. Sure, we've made it American because it says E Pluribus Unum, right. but it's really an ancient Babylonian symbol on American currency. We're really borrowing that symbol of debt, huh? Yeah, exactly. From another culture. Yes, the Babylonians were the ones that sort of invented financial debt. Why do you say that you see money as alive? Because it's always changing and it's always having an impact on us. Uh, it's having a biological impact on us. When you touch money, right, people uh, counted 80 $100 bills and other people counted 80 pieces of paper and they put their finger in hot scalding water heated up to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. The people that touch money report feeling less pain. It dulls our senses. Wow. Yeah. When I say the word money to you, you're likely getting an electrical current sent through your skin. It's increasing the electricity, the uh, 
of your skin, you're getting an electrical charge essentially. There's an electrical current. Huh. And so there's a biological impact of money. And so it's alive because it's affecting us, our skin, it's affecting mm. our heart rate, our heartbeat increases, it's the mere thought of money. So that's why I say it's constantly alive. And it's constantly uh, governing so much of our decision making. You talk a lot in the book about um, religious history, cultural history. How might money have actually shaped religion? Money has had a very profound impact on the scriptures, uh, but also on perhaps the invention of some religions. All right, so where does money get invented in the world? The coins, that is. Ancient Greece, around the fifth century, mm. same time it's in China, same time it's in India. And what happens about a hundred years after its invention? You have three religious leaders, right? Mm. You have Pythagoras, who's a religious leader. You have Confucius, you have Buddha, right? And what are they all saying? They're all essentially saying that like, you need to live an ascetic lifestyle. It's mm. a response to money. Mm. Even Jesus and Muhammad were preaching to poor yeah. people, right? Yeah. So it was a response to, oh, we don't have the money. We can find a following among the, the disenfranchised. Yeah. So some scholars believe money was a, a way to sort of invoke religion, to create organized religion. And I found that one of the most profound um, scriptures in all of my teaching was in, uh, in Calcutta, India. I was in Mother Teresa's home for the dying and destitute. And this is where people go to die. It's really a sad and tragic and uh, a moving place. And I asked uh, one of the volunteers, I said, why are you here? He said, Kabir, I'm here because of what the scripture teaches. And I said, what does the scripture teach? He's maybe 17 years old. He says, though people in here are poor, they're rich with spirit, mm -hmm. right? And I went back and reread the, the scriptures. And sure enough, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about, you know, the template for Christian life. and talks about how it's important to put away, to, put up, to, lay away, uh, to lay away treasures here on earth and put up treasures in heaven, right? So he's constantly coming back to this refrain that it's important to celebrate that which is everlasting. Mm -hmm. We don't take money with us to the next life, right? So that's, what, that's the point I try to emphasize in the book. How has money rewired our brains? So money is a, is a stimulant, right? So again, the brain scans of people who are high on cocaine, we start to think, oh, maybe we can win money, and we start to anticipate. It's actually interesting. The anticipation of money is more exciting than money itself. Hmm. Yeah. And so when, you, when, peop, when people think they're going to win money, their uh, nucleus accumbens, their reward center starts firing. It's like, like, like this is all this neural activity. And then when they get the money, their excitement level sort of drops. Uh. This can even be done for like in the television business. You know when you do a tease, it's like, oh, coming up, we have so-and-so as a guest. Mm. That tease is more exciting to the audience than maybe the interview itself. Right. So this principle, like sort of the idea of expected gain is so rewarding to us. Is that how things like gambling problems sure. <laughs> develop sure. so easily? Yeah, gambling problems are is an addictive behavior. and. One thing that money induces is also testosterone, so, so or any any um, uh, certain types of hormones. So, for example, if they took um, uh, cheek swaps of people traders in the London trading pit, and they found that sure enough that during market volatility, market volatility, there was more periods of volatility uh, of testosterone being evoked mm. in traders. So they found testosterone was a, there was correlation between market volatility, riskier behavior, uh -huh. yeah, and testosterone yeah. levels, and then they took they asked people to inhale testosterone nasal sprays, and after people took these sprays, people made more volatile investment decisions. Wow. So it's always a, um, money is, is being governed by our genetics and our genes and our hormones, <laughs> yeah. What is neuroeconomics, and what, what should we know about neuroscience and its connection with money? This is probably one of the most fascinating aspects, uh, I think, in my book, or just the idea of money itself. Neuroeconomics, what is basically someone is a brain scientist who uses brain scans to examine financial decision making. And you can see like, what part of the brains are activating when you make financial decisions. So neuroscientists have been able to predict what songs, what pop songs will be hits by reading the brain scans of teenagers, huh. right? Or what movies will be a hit. They've already done this. They just look at it. You ask a bunch of teenagers, and they ask them a bunch of questions, and they 
then they sell that information back to uh, studios. And a lot of uh, big corporations, Google, Coca-Cola, are looking at neuromarketing. When they do an advertisement, they want to see brain scans. Is it activating the nucleus accumbens? Is it activating the reward center? Mm. So I think the day was, will come when um, neuroeconomists are basically making predictions of the marketplace. And so, you know, we're already making predictions of the marketplace. Every day there's economists saying the market's going to be up or down. Based on what? Well, how about based on some real hard evidence of what the mind is thinking when you, when you digest news? Mm. So I, I think that day will come. That could change everything. Yes, <laughs> exactly. How has collective wisdom affected uh, the development and all the rules sort of that we place around money? The collective wisdom obviously changes no matter where, where uh, you are in society. So for example, in um, the 19th century in British Columbia in the Pacific Northwest, Native Americans, they had a ceremony called the potlatch. What they do, they would, one tribe would invite all of the, the sister tribes, and they all come and they have a big ceremony. And then they would start to give out lavish gifts on everyone. They would line up all the gifts and start giving them out to everyone. And what were they doing? They were shaming the other tribes, saying, look at how much wealth we have. Oh. We're going to embarrass you with our riches. You're never going to be able to repay this. So a gift, collective wisdom in this case, a gift wasn't just something, a nice gesture. A gift was a way to control the other person. Mm -hmm. you won't, you'll never be able to repay this. So that is one example of how like, the collective wisdom within this particular Native com American community was basically a way to obligate you to future, to future interactions. That's not too different than even today. Look at Kickstarter. When you get that email from a friend, Kickstarter, yeah. and it's like, hey, I'm a musician, I'm a documentary maker, will you send $20 to my Kickstarter campaign? Well, you could say no, right, and suffer the consequences with your friendship. But if you, if you put the $20 in, now what happens is you've now reversed it, that that person's not obligated to keep you informed of, of you know the money you prolong that See, next time you go to a Starbucks and they and the, one of the baristas gives you a cup of coffee and you don't have to pay for it you'll feel a little bit obligated to go back there yeah and continue your business with them yeah but the, the way money works is once I give you the money this relationship is over mm -hmm. and I'll see you later so money has basically money has basically um, created a more anonymous um, marketplace mm. where it's just valued on dollars and cents. It's not as you're not as reliant on your on relationships or your family. That's a good thing. That could be a negative thing. Mm -hmm. Really brings out the independence in individuals, yeah. but maybe also severs you a little bit from some of your relationships. Yeah, it can be very burdening. In Montreal, every um, year they have something called Moving Day, where everyone moves. It just goes back to the '60s, where like everyone moves, it's, and huh. they even have. Um, TV commercials about moving day and you're supposed to call your friends and family and they're supposed to help you move. What happens? Sometimes your friends don't show up, they flake on you, your family like is busy and so people feel incredibly <laughs> obligated and like they get sort of depressed that their friends are like not, are flaking on them. So when you have money you can just pay a, a moving company, mm -hmm. right? So there's people try to escape the family relationships using money to the marketplace. Everyone talks about the corrosive nature of the marketplace, but there's also a good thing to it. You yeah. can be anonymous and carry out your business. How and why did we go from metal money, coins, to paper money? I went to Mongolia to answer that question. And the reason I went there is because, uh, really officially in the middle of nowhere, that was the seat of the ancient Mongol Empire. And that was really the first time that paper money was used in such a large uh, way. So uh, Kublai Khan, who was like the ruler, I mean his empire stretched from modern day Burma to Hungary, the Mongols. Oh. And so one of the largest empires in the world. Kublai Khan, he invaded the Chinese, he added 60 million people to his kingdom, he realized, uh-oh, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough precious metal to back my paper. Because at that point, the paper was backed by silver, was backed by um, silk. Mm. So he cut that link. He said, you know what? I'm only going to issue paper money. This is in the 13th century AD. And he cut that link between metal and money. And he said, essentially, if you don't accept this money, 
I'll kill you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that always works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'll kill you. If you counterfeit this money, I'll also kill you, right? So, um, but what ends up happening is when you have paper money, he started to spend, right? Because there was no cap on how much you could issue. You could just, Marco Polo says, the great Khan issues money out of the barks of trees, is mm -hmm. the quote. So he just keeps on issuing this money, and there's more spending, runaway inflation, depreciation, currency crisis, financial crisis, goodbye Mongol Empire, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the historical example of the, the severance between money, uh, metal and money. In the modern day, talk a little bit about when uh, paper money basically unhooked from gold and how the Federal Reserve works with the banks now to create money. It's a big complicated organizational bureaucratic chart of how money is made. Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard in the early 1970s because we were undergoing really a lot of inflation. It was called the Great Inflation. People attribute this back to the, the Vietnam War, there's so much spending, and we needed a way to sort of retain the value of the dollar. So he goes on TV during an, before an episode of Bonanza, <laughs> and he says, we're cutting suspending convertibility to gold, and that was the end of Bretton Woods. Since that time, um, the dollar has lost about 83% of its purchasing power. You know, the dollar continues to decline in terms mm -hmm. of how much uh, it can buy. And so that is attributable to inflation, right? Because we keep on printing more and more money. And when you print more of something, that decreases its value. Mm. So it's the 1970s, Richard Nixon. Um, and so I think we haven't seen incredible inflation materialize right now, but you know, almost every, I've looked at 5,000 years of monetary history, it never ends well. Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, you print, 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 and it's hard yeah. to curb that printing. Right. So that's the modern example of, of the gold standard. How money is made, so the federal government says, oh, we want to put more money into the economy. So the Federal Reserve goes to the banks, essentially, and says, loan out more money. And so when the bank loans money to you, that's creating money in into the system. Um, is that fair? Is it fair, because is it fair for private corporation banks to create money? It's a matter of debate. You know, is, is money a public resource? Well, when there's a problem, we use money as a public resource to bail out institutions, right? Right. Uh, I mean, the water company, for example, water is a public resource. The water companies make a little profit on issuing water or providing water to everyone. Like banks make a lot of money issuing money to everyone. Yeah. So there's big difference, right? Yeah. There's <laughs> some there's some theorists who say maybe we could go outside the banking system uh -huh. and issue money directly to people, for example. <laughs> And it seems like the wealthy get bailed out with money more than the poor get helped yeah. up with money. Mayor Rothschild, who is the sort of the, the father figure of the Rothschild family, he says essentially, "I don't care who writes the rules, just give me the power to create money." Hmm. So there's an alliance between the government and the banks. The government essentially says to the banks, "You can create the money, you can make money on these loans, but give us the capacity to borrow as much as we want." Mm -hmm. So it's un really an unholy alliance, some scholars write, about between banking and government. What about the Bitcoin? Uh, talk to us a little bit about that innovation and how do you think the physicality of money might change in the future? Bitcoin is, is really a profound technology. Bitcoin is a way to authenticate a transaction in a decentralized way. What does that mean? A quick story, just to put it in perspective, um, there was an island of, called Yap in the early 20th century, late 19th century, and they had these big stone blocks that were used as money. And they said, you know what, we're gonna have one bookkeeper, because these, these stone rocks are too big to lug everywhere, and we're going to, anytime there's a transaction, we're going to update this ledger. Eventually, this guy starts to cook the books. Mm -hmm. So they say, you know what we're gonna do? Everyone's gonna get their own record-keeping book, essentially. And any, anytime there's a transaction, we're all gonna update our books. That's the technology Bitcoin really uses. Mm. It's not one person, one bookkeeper. It's a bunch of computers keeping the record. It's a decentralized way to authenticate transactions. Mm. So when you don't have one bookkeeper and you have many bookkeepers, that takes away the power of that one bookkeeper. In this mm. case, the banks, the brokers, yeah. anyone who sits in the middle of a transaction is now being effectively dis disintermediated. That's the technology behind Bitcoin. It's really profound. Yeah. And I think Bitcoin is going to be really, really powerful in the emerging world. Mm. It takes, I was in Saudi Arabia not too long ago talking to a Filipino 
a servant, uh, a maid there, essentially. It takes 15% for her to send money from Saudi, Saudi Arabia to the Philippines. Mm. And most of those fees go to the companies who are remitting the money. So using Bitcoin, she would be able to convert into Bitcoin at a fraction of the cost and then convert into the local currency at like 1%, if that. Hmm. So anytime there's a lot of middlemen, Bitcoin can come in and basically disintermediate that. So that's Bitcoin, and I think Bitcoin is going to be very profound in the emerging world. You ask about the physicality of money. 85% of transactions in the world are still based in cash. Hmm. Right? Really? Yeah, not just in the developing world, like that makes sense, the developing right. world, but also in the developed world. Huh. Germany has 80 million people, but only 10 million credit cards. Wow. Yeah, and that's because there's cultural reasons. The word in German, Jennifer, is uh, for debt is Schuld, which means sin huh. or guilt, right? Also in Japan or in China, mm -hmm. it's tough to find credit cards because in China, people save their own money. Right? There's not a big social safety net. There's not social security to the extent we know it here. Right. So my, my big um, takeaway here is that money is always going to be uh, a physical thing, at least for the next several decades. Mm. However, in America, how will it impact us? When you use a credit card, <coughs> when you use a credit card, there's less activation in your insula in the brain. Really? So that means that it's less painful to use a credit card than right. to see money. When you see money leaving your hands, mm -hmm. there's more activation in your insula. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm spending money. But when you go to Starbucks and drink your latte and you don't even see it because it's touching your phone, yeah. less painful. How does money reflect our human values? And how do you think money should be used perhaps differently in the future? Yeah, I think money, uh, depending on how we use it, re reveals our character, right? Like, if a wealthy person does not give much of his money away, he's stingy or he's, he's not giving. If a poor person gives all her money away, she's abundantly wealthy, right? And so I found one of the most profound ways to think about money uh, coming from the Hindu tradition. In Hinduism, there's four aims to life. One of the aims is called artha, which means the accumulation of money. It is your duty to make artha. It is your duty to make enough resources because you have to feed your family. You have mm. to take care of your, your friends. But one of the goals, one of these four goals, is called moksha or liberation. Like, you have to liberate from money. Mm. One, uh, one day you should. And um, it's interesting how Hinduism connects the two ideas. It's saying that you have to pursue artha. Because when you pursue money, you'll be able to take all, care of all your material needs. But that pursuit of money will leave you hollow. It will leave you looking for something else. And that will awaken you to the need for moksha. Mm -hmm. It will awaken you to liberation. And so in Hinduism, this can correspond to periods of your life. Like early in your life, you're about artha, making money. But as you leave the world and you're getting older, you should start to renounce it and focus on the things that truly matter. Mm. This can correspond to periods of your day. When you wake up in the morning and you're doing business, making a deal, going to work. But when you come home, you should put away the artha. Go for a moksha, spend time with your family. Mm -hmm. Renounce those things. So I think that's a, a very strong principle of how to deal with money and how to think about it in a more, I think, profound way. Kabir, thank you so much for sharing about your book, Coined With Us. We really appreciate all of your insights. This is Sartor TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.